Hello, I'm Sarah McDonald. And I'm Rebecca Huntley. Welcome to the full well, catastrophe. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. We're always shocked that people come out in the day to see us or the night in the cold. Um, Oh, Sarah, what am I supposed to say? It's in here, it's on the page. I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. We are extremely excited to be here outside of Sydney. We've left a city where it's about $2 million for a one-bedroom apartment looking out into some disgusting rat-infested lane. It does have inferior coffee, and I'm not just saying that to, to make you like me, but it does. <laughs> And the kind of vain, entitled sense of self that kind of tastes like chicken. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's so expensive we can't afford therapy, which is basically why we started the full catastrophe, because, let's face it, we live in ridiculous times and we have ridiculous lives. So that's how the full catastrophe really came about. And, for instance, like, just getting here today... For me, um, I'm sure this is for all of you, it nearly didn't happen. My son coughed all night long and then was too sick to go to school, so I had to find a Chilean labourer who's a backpacker working in the local area to spend the day with him. Uh, my mother got to an international airport without a passport and at 84 years old she had an anxiety attack. And then when my dog saw my suitcase, he literally had a panic attack, froze, eyes rolled back in his head and started shaking. And that was all before 8am this morning. <laughs> so... But we, you're, thrilled, you're thrilled to be here. I'm so <laughs> glad to be here. I'm like, I'm forgetting all of that now. That just goes out of my mind. So, look, we recognise that this is basically a kind of silly life that is overstretched and we're overwrought, but we're really entitled. And that's what this is about. This is all first world problems, right? But lots of first world problems, lots of them. Lots of yeah, first world problems, yes. Yeah. So because we thought we couldn't really cry and whinge about them, we thought we should laugh about them, and that's how the full catastrophe was born. The initial title was Clusterfuck, but we couldn't put that on the podcast. Apparently, you're not allowed to say that a lot. But, but you know, now you can say anything, really, can't you? Could we, call, could we rename it? No. No, OK, all right, go ahead. Absolutely not. So we wanted to thank our guests tonight. Um, we're so excited to have our catastrophizers tonight. We have Libby Gore, Giselle Onya Nguyen, Maxine McHugh and Sammy Shah. Please make them welcome. We do need to give people... Um, ABC people, other things to do, other sources of income, don't we, really? And pretty much except for Giselle, that's where they all come from. Is it me? No, you are. You're going to introduce Libby. No, you're oh, going to going to? Libby. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Um, Libby Gore. Look, all of you, well, pretty much everybody in the room would know Libby as her other extraordinary self, the TV wunderkind wild child, Elle McFeast. But she's had an extraordinary career since Elle went to wherever Elle went to. So when Libby first heard the former Governor-General and feminist Quinton Bryce say, it is possible for a woman to have it all, just not all at once, she said to herself, bullshit, um, we'll see about that. And in fact, Libby has had a career on ABC Melbourne Radio, she's had a career writing, um, she's done all kinds of things and she uh, has dealing at the moment, not unlike Sarah, with older parents, younger children, a partner working freelance. What she had to do to get here this evening, the complex, almost Napoleonic organisation of getting out on a Friday night for a mother with all these kinds of um, commitments is extraordinary. Please welcome Libby Gore. Firstly, um, thank you to Sarah and to Rebecca for having us here. And I do find it rather ironic that you would say that you're giving all these ABC people an alternate source of income because you're not paying us. <laughs> so uh, that's the first thing I wanted to say. And uh, the second thing I wanted to say is I'll just let you guys just revel in that little fantasy that Melbourne is still cheaper than Sydney. That's not <laughs> enough, right? Though we do have better coffee and our backpackers aren't from Chile. They're from Switzerland. Now... I too would like to give thanks to the traditional owners of and we meet. I'd like to thank the Wheeler Centre for hosting us, Sarah and Rebecca, the full catastrophe for allowing me to share the genesis of one of the most fascinating discoveries 
I have made in my life of family creation. And this uh, fascination, this species that I would like to pay tribute to tonight is, of course, the species known as babysitter. <laughs> uh, I'll just go here because it's more comfortable for me. I'm less formal. This species known as babysitter, I need to tell you that I needed a babysitter and I needed a babysitter really bad because when we moved from Sydney back to Melbourne with two small children, part of the reason was so that my children could grow up with their grandparents, my parents, who lived in Melbourne. And we were told by all and sundry, and I knew in my heart that that would make life just so much easier. And then, along the way, I realised that occasionally, I did need someone to mind my children who would be kind about me behind my back, <laughs> who would respect the rules and boundaries that I had decided I would create from my children that were different from my own childhood, and who basically uh, I could pay, say goodbye to, wave at the front door, I'd never have to worry about ringing again. And I realised over time that this was not my parents. So I needed a babysitter and my daughter asked if she could help, bless her. She was all of six and a half, already my equal, <laughs> in so many ways apparently. I said to her, no darling, no thank you. This was adult business. As she and her brother were our most important treasures and daddy was working interstate. So therefore I needed to take full responsibility in whose care I left them. And that choice was up to me, the adult, to do. Now, I do not know where you people go for things that you need the most in life, but I am here before you to share with you my most intimate of treasure chests, the place where I go for things that really matter to me when I really need them and they are everything I need to give true life to my authentic self. That place my friends, is Gumtree. <laughs> this is where I go for my heart's desire, for my authentic wants. Here's my little trick, though. I never use my real name. The reason why is because in this sort of endeavour, when you're looking for a babysitter, there needs to be full trust, support, respect and transparency between whoever I pick to take care of my children and myself, and I can't give that to them <laughs> until they know who I really am. So I have a gum tree name, and my gum tree name is Debbie. Now, why Debbie? Well, it's because when I was growing up, I looked Libby up in the Dictionary of Names, and I found that Libby meant wallflower. I went to a little private girls' school, very posh, very white, very Anglo-Saxon, very out of place was I with my brown hair, my bulbous nose and my dumpy thighs and my grandmothers who said good shabbos on a Friday night. <laughs> my name was Libby. I didn't fit in. All I wanted was to fit in and throw away those corned beef sandwiches and have a ham and cheese one just like everybody else. I wanted to be called the ultimate Anglo-Saxon Glen Iris name, Debbie. And on Gumtree, I can be whoever I want. So Debbie, it is. I put a notice up on Gumtree for a babysitter. And for some crazy reason, I must have put up a phone number, probably because it was not my real name and therefore I thought that no one would really make the connection. And so it came to pass one Friday morning that my partner was interstate working I was getting the two kids who went to two different schools that were situated in two very different areas because we had moved halfway through their schooling and I needed to get both of them to school by nine. You can see the passion in my voice as to what an effort that was. One was just starting school, one was staying at the same school because he didn't want to leave because he'd had his established friends there. I had interviews planned that day, one with the Prime Minister and the other with, um, in keeping with my new position as a health and wellness expert for the chronically challenged and eternally optimistic, <laughs> that is the frauds, just like you, the woman that drops her kids off in school in her gym outfit and never bloody goes. <laughs> I had an interview with a faecal chanter. 
Do you know what a fecal chanter is? It's someone who, when they go to defecate, chants. So instead of saying, um, they go, um, it's different. <laughs> and then suddenly the phone rings and I say to my son, have you put your lunch in your bag? As I answer the phone and I say, hello. And then a voice says, oh, hello, it's Claire calling. Is that Debbie? And I go, no, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, hello, it's Debbie speaking. <laughs> Oh, hello, my name's Claire. Um, I was wondering if that babysitting position is still available. And I look at the clock. It's 8.35, Claire has rung just at peak panic point. I need to drop one at school by now to get the other one to school by nine. And so I say the only reasonable thing I can, which is, oh, hello, Claire, love, lovely to speak to you. Yes, it is, Debbie, but listen, I'm on my own this morning and I've got a double school drop off to get to, both kids at school by nine. Would you mind if we spoke a little bit later in the day? If that's suitable. I was very proud of myself with that. <laughs> proud. And do you know what she said to me? She said this. She said, oh, you know, that's fine, but actually it doesn't suit me at all. I've uh, got a full day of university lectures and uh, it won't take long. I just need to ask you a few questions. <laughs> and she said this to me just as I was gesticulating to one, my six-year-old, that they needed to clean their teeth, and two, to the 10-year-old, that they should put a jumper on and put his lunch in his bag. And in the midst of all of that, my reply just fell out of my mouth, just like this. I said, look, Claire, I said, I understand that you might have a busy day, but I'm actually in a real rush. I'm on my own this morning. I haven't packed the bags properly. I need to get the kids to two different schools by nine in 20 minutes. I need to call you back so we can speak properly. And I was so proud that I'd kept up the accent. And then she said to me, you know, I know, Debbie, you might be busy, but as I said, that doesn't suit. <laughs> she said, if we could have a quick word now, I'd be able to tell whether or not this is an appropriate position. And then I said, because by this stage, the filter had fallen off, well, it's obviously not an appropriate position, Claire, because actually, by definition, a babysitting job is a helping position. Your job would be to make my job easier, not harder, and we haven't got off on a very good foot, have we? <laughs> and then she said to me, you know, you don't really sound like a person I'd be happy working with anyway. Clunk. She hung up on me. My daughter goes, Mom, who was that? Was that the babysitter? And I went, um, um, and I'm thinking to myself, just let it go. You can still make the nine o'clock drop off. Just things that pick up the things. Just do it. Don't give into temptation. Just get yourself out the door. But I couldn't help myself, could I? Because these new mobile phones have got the last number called there. It's very easy, isn't it? No, I had to send the little bitch a text, didn't I? <laughs> didn't I? Claire, I go. Hi, my daughter's going, Mom, Mom, I spilled toothpaste on my jumper. Mom, Mom, where's my lunch? Shush, Mummy's busy. Hi, Claire, I text, thanks for your call. I really think you should reconsider your part-time work options. Helping another woman doesn't mean making them work around you. Full stop, Debbie. <laughs> and I picked up the bags and put the kids in the car. Well, I'm just about to back out into the street. <laughs> oh, oh, and then I hear it, beep, 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 beep. My son says, mom, your phone's beeping. I go, I know it's beeping. <laughs> and I'm driving and I've already got 11 points on my license <laughs> and I just couldn't help it. And even though I'm driving, I have to have a look and it's from her, Claire. A message, Mom, you're driving, shush! <laughs> Debbie, it reads, I feel sad for you. <laughs> you're obviously a hopeless woman and though I feel sorry for you, I feel more for your kids. <laughs> <sighs> Rage, how dare she! 
I'm driving down Dandenong Road, about to turn into Taronga. You know exactly the turn off I mean, don't you, where the service station is. I hang myself a left. Then the policeman comes up on the motorbike. He pulls me over. That's four points and another $350. With the phone between my legs, I'm going to be on probation for a year. I say to my son, get out of the car now. You can walk the other 50 metres. He says, why, Mum? I say, because it's nearly 9 o'clock and I've got to send a text. Claire, I texted. I said, shush, to my other child. This is important. Mummy has to be right. <laughs> you obviously have no idea about the complexities of working and mothering and needing another woman to babysit your kids. Interesting when you write babysit, there is autocorrect on the word babysit and it comes up as baby shit. Come back to me should you be lucky enough to experience this. Full stop, Debbie. <laughs> I thought that was gracious. I thought it was fitting of a woman my age, my status, my wisdom, my fame, my experience, my beauty, my glamour, my children. <laughs> my son was at school. Hopefully he'd got there on his own, thank goodness. <laughs> en route to the other school. Beep, beep, beep. Mummy, it's a text. Give me the phone, I say to my daughter. No, she says, going into my bag. You're driving. You can't have it. Two hands on the wheel, mummy. Mummy, she screams just before I break before the red light. I narrowly miss hitting the car in front of a set of red lights. He should count himself lucky because I was very cross that morning. <laughs> my daughter says to me, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll read it to you, mummy. And then she proceeds to read the text. Women like you shouldn't be allowed to have children. <laughs> My daughter reads to me, Mummy, is that from the new babysitter? <laughs> Give it to me! I grab the phone. Hang on, then my daughter says. She says to me, Mum, who's Debbie? I say, it must be the wrong number. <laughs> and she hops out of the car. Not before we've done our full two minutes of kiss and go, though. Oh, how authentic were they? I drive home, I go inside, I'm absolutely fuming, not just because of the messages, but because all the fine, all the points on my licence that I no longer have, but because I can see in the midst of all of this, I actually have forgotten to put my son's lunch in his school bag and I have to get back in the car and drive all the way back to Morven Primary School. I'm 15 minutes later for the faecal chanter whose whole shtick was beginning to shit me any more than the whole fucking purpose of the whole thing. No, I couldn't get Claire out of my head. This Claire, the babysitter who wasn't this, this girl who had seen through my carefully constructed, independent, achieving woman facade and reduced me to the incompetent, bumbling failure of not just a woman but a mother with no real career prospects left to speak of. After school, I picked up my son at home first because it was on the way home from work, dropped him back at our place. Then I went to get my daughter from aftercare. Mum, she said to me, Mum, how did you go with the babysitter? Not so good, I said. That one didn't work out. Don't worry, she said. I found one. One of the carers from aftercare. She just lives around the corner. And she handed me a piece of paper and my daughter, the most amazing child of six and a half, had picked up the carer from aftercare and got her to write her phone number down on a piece of paper saying that mummy was looking for a babysitter. I thought, what a clever little girl she is. And she handed me the piece of paper and I looked at the number. <laughs> I said, what's her name? Dali said, it's Gemma. And I looked at the number again and I dialed it and I said, Hello, it's Libby calling. Dali's mum from aftercare. She tells me that you're interested in babysitting. She says, Oh God, yes I am. She said, I'm so relieved it was you. Your phone came up as no caller ID. See, I'm not so stupid after all because she would... <laughs> you wouldn't believe what happened to me this morning, she said. I went for this babysitting job with this English woman called Debbie. <laughs> My God, she was a complete nightmare. Her poor kids, she called me names. We got into a texting war. I said, oh my God, how did that happen? With innocence, how did she get your number? She said, Gumtree. I said, you really should be more careful. 
She said, it's okay, I never use my real name, I just make one up. <laughs> oh, I said, that's good, that means you can be any name you like. Like, I don't know. She goes, <laughs> Claire. I went, Claire. <laughs> I prefer Gemma, I said. And to cut a long story short, that's how I'm with you here tonight. Gemma's at my place making pizza for the kids. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's a true story. Oh my gosh. Imagine if there's like an Uber rating for mothers by babysitters. I reckon who's got more stars? I mean, how much is the Chilean backpacker labourer giving me compared to Gemma? If she ever finds out, you're in. We're going to be on. We're going to be in equal you. numbers of rating. I want to go drinking with Debbie from Gumtree. That's right. <laughs> she has got a lot of sass, the old Debbie from Gumtree. She sounds great. Yeah. She does. Our next, wow, okay, our next speaker this yes. evening, our uh, next catastrophizer. Uh, Giselle Onyanyuan is a writer and a communications manager for the Feminist Writers Festival. She writes for BuzzFeed, for Frankie, for Vice, and uh, she's also been a regular columnist for Daily Life. She's far too young and accomplished and fabulous to have had full catastrophes, I'm sure. But she has got a bit of a dating story, so it could get raunchy. She wanted to warn you. Yeah, language warning. Yeah. No, no. Well, she's warned us because we're so easily <laughs> shocked, aren't we, Rebecca? No, not at all. Please welcome <laughs> Giselle. Hello. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and to say thanks to Sarah and Rebecca for having me and to say sorry for all of you for what you're about to hear and to say sorry to my parents especially. Um, anyway, let's go. So online dating is what we might call my brand. So anytime I meet a new person, my friends say, tell them that story about that guy and that thing that he did. And it's a great way to bond with other people, especially women about the weird stuff that we've experienced. And I think that it's, always a, it's also a modern day study of the human experience. So how strange and beautiful and depraved it can be. And everybody has an origin story and this is mine. The story of the first one night stand I ever had back in 2014 when I was 25 years old in a magical land called New York City. So I'd been in a relationship for five years and it was getting a little bit stale. I thought we were gonna have it all. Marriage, kids, a house with a garden and a fence and minimum 1,000 dogs. But I was 25 and I'd only ever dated or slept with one person before. And the pangs of jealousy were strong when I saw my friends experiencing things that I thought maybe I never would. I was Aladdin looking at the palace on the outside looking in and I wanted to see it up close. So I'd booked a trip to the States when we were still together uh, that he couldn't come on because of work, but by the time it rolled around, we'd been broken up for two months and I had experienced my first mini heartbreak with the person I rebounded hard on for three weeks. Um, three weeks that felt like a lifetime, like an entire relationship condensed into six super intense dates. So suffice to say, I was ready to get the hell out of Melbourne and get my smooch on with people I'd never see again. A concept I'd never really understood before my heart smashed twice in two months, and I just wanted intimacy and attention without complication while I tried to piece it back together. So there I was in New York, swiping hard enough to welcome a case of RSI, and talking to boys who looked like they had slid right out the birth canal of a Vampire Weekend album. Um, one of them caught my attention. He was 32, which seemed very mature. He shared the name of a luxury handbag. Uh, he also had a dog and an apartment of his own in the trendy Brooklyn neighborhood of Flatbush, full of guitars and art prints. He had a cool job and liked cool music, so naturally, I was sold. So we met up for dinner in his neighborhood and he was a lot shorter than I thought he would be, like probably around my height and I'm the size of a small child. So. Um, but I didn't really think it mattered. Conversation was pretty easy. He was really nice. Felt like I was living somebody else's life. A girl whose heart was full, who could go on dates with older men halfway around the world without any care and just do whatever. Um, so after dinner, he asked if we could bop back to his apartment to let his friend in who had just arrived to stay with him from Portland. So we did and um, she said, oh, I really feel like going for a drink. So there's, suddenly there's just this third random on my Tinder date. 
Um, which definitely sounds like the beginning of a porn, but it definitely wasn't. Anyway, so uh, we walked to his favourite local bar, which is a flower shop by day and a drinking hole by night. I know. <laughs> Uh, so I was becoming more obsessed with this like bohemian twee idea of New York and my new life and everything and I knew it was something that I would remember. I didn't really anticipate the stuff that was going to happen, but that's okay. Uh, so we walked into the bar and he froze and he said, see that girl sitting at the bar over there? Uh, we used to date and I took her here on our first date and now she's here with another guy. And I was like, cool, I don't really, I don't really care, but okay. And he's like, I need to go talk to her. And I was like, hmm, okay. okay. So uh, over he waltzes to this woman who's clearly on a date with another guy. And instead of being a normal person and just saying, hey, how's it going? He stood next to her and kind of just like went like this to motion at the bartender so she would see him in her peripheral vision. Um, and so I just kind of stood there watching this horrible scene unfold, kind of with the same fascination and disgust that I watch people popping their pimples on YouTube, like you can't look away, right? So I uh, eventually came back, clearly flustered, and his friend went to the bathroom and I thought, well, I've come all this way, so I might as well like get what I'm here for. And I said, you know what would probably really piss your ex off if she saw us making out? It's pretty smooth, right? I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> Um, and so he leaned in to kiss me, his hands were flat by his side, so he was just like mashing his face into my face, and I was like, good. Um, so, so we continued to do that on and off, and one point he was in the bathroom and his friend said, so how do you guys know each other? It seems like you're such good friends from so long ago. And then she was like, oh my God, I didn't know I was crashing a date, and I was like, well, I'm kind of glad you're here, to be honest, but... Uh, whatever. And eventually it was like one in the morning and we all went back to his place and he'd just adopted a new dog, which was very cute. His name was Friday because he found her on a Friday. Um, so him and my, him and he was sitting on one side and me and his friend and the dog were sitting on the other side. And I was like, what the hell? Like, I'm just, uh, I'm just going to text him and say, do you want to keep making out? And I, because I was just so desperate for validation at this point, and I was like, I hate this, but I feel like it's going to be a story, and maybe one day I'll stand in front of a room of people and tell it. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, so we suddenly said to his friend that we were going to go take the dog for a walk, which wasn't supposed to be a euphemism, but if you want to feel free to use it as a way to describe horrible interactions that make your flaps slam shut, please feel free. So then we took that poor dog for a walk. So we hadn't even taken three steps when he stopped me in the middle of the street and kissed me again, hands but still by his sides, like we were two kids kissing on the front of a Christmas card, you know, just like the... <laughs> um, and I could really feel my soul eroding at this point, but... Um... <laughs> And then he started moaning into my mouth and I was like, this is bad, but it's 1.30 a.m. and I'm in a city I don't know and I don't know how I'm going to get home. I don't even know where I am. And he said, if it's not too weird, you're welcome to stay at mine. And I was like, mm, okay, you don't feel, it doesn't feel like you're going to murder me or anything. So um, I guess that's fine. And I didn't know that things were going to get really weird, but I was like, okay. So we went back to his and I said, can I borrow a shirt to sleep in? But because he was so small, it was like a fitted tee. Um, <laughs> And we got into bed and made out some more and I just couldn't stop thinking about all this other stuff, like being heartbroken about stuff back home. But I was like, well, this is what I was, I'm here for, I guess. It's like a time for new experiences, whatever. But like, here I am with somebody else and isn't this what I want, what I wanted anyway? So then he pulled down the front of my bra and kind of went at my boobs like a little kitten drinking a bowl of milk, like a... <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is so bad, but I don't really know what to do, so I guess <laughs> I guess I'll just wait for it to end. Like, it was <laughs> very enthusiastic, but I was like, this is bad, good. Um, I didn't really know what time it was or anything, but I was like, I guess, I guess we're all faced with adversity sometimes and we just have to power through, so I was like, good. Um, and then he said can I go down on you? But it was the first day of my period and I was like, I'm not going to give a stranger the Dolmio grin. So, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. Um, so it was all really weird and kind of gross and I was just like, oh, I don't know. I, and I was so sad that I didn't really care and then I figured that I should probably touch it so I kind of just did and it was so underwhelming that I just went to sleep. Like I didn't want to deal with it so I just went to sleep. 
So in the morning, we walked the dog, which again is not a euphemism, and when we got back, I apologised for leaving him hanging the night before, because, and, and then he looked at his watch and he said brightly, well, we've still got 20 minutes, um, which is great foreplay in my opinion. Uh, so there we were again making out and he said, will you go down on me? And I said, absolutely fucking not. Uh, and so he started jerking off and then he said, it's hard to do this when you're in the way. Um, <laughs> And I really wondered if this was what my parents had in mind when they risked their lives at sea as refugees to build a better future for their children. <laughs> and, and so then we caught the train together. He went to work. I went back to my friend's apartment and I experienced my first ever walk of shame when I crept in and found my family friend who I'd known since I was born and her partner having breakfast and reading the paper and they said, where have you been? With a very knowing expression and I just bolted. And um, as my life as a serial dater and hookupper has progressed, I've really shared that shame and I'm very proud of it, as everybody should be, but uh, given the events of this evening, I've, I really feel like this was one to remember. <laughs> And so a month later, I'm back in Melbourne and my New York City bedfellow messaged me on Facebook and he says, did you leave a bra at my place? And I'm like, mate, what are you going to do? Post it to me? Like, just keep it. Jesus. And then he sent me an Instagram video of him in the shower, just kind of going like this. And the caption was, don't forget to wash your hair. We're no longer Facebook friends. Um, but in the four years since then, I've experienced the whole spectrum of casual hookups, dating and sex, from the guy who I found out post-hookup had been up for four days on meth, which is especially delightful as his day job was drug and alcohol counselling, <laughs> to the time I pegged on a first date, an achievement I still think about daily. And I wanted to see what was out there, and I did. It kind of sucks, but I was really sheltered, and I feel like I've learned so much about myself and other people and the world from all the strange and beautiful and downright, down, downright fucked up things that have happened to me. But you say you never forget your first, and mine was the boy with a handbag name, a thirst for blood, and a really cute dog on a night when I was completely sober, as I had been for years, and it may or may not be a coincidence that I started drinking quite regularly straight after I got home from that trip. <laughs> so I'd just like to give a shout out to that boy for a night I'll never forget. Hope you remember me just as fondly as I remember you, but please don't tell a story about me for a podcast. Thanks. <laughs> Should we start swiping? Can we have a look? Who is, he? Can, is, is Handbag Boy in here? No, you're not friends no, with him on time. Isn't sorry, that flower go. shop, cafe, bar now like a place where people tell stories about sex dates? <laughs> no. Um, normally with a full catastrophe, Sarah and I like to tell a story, but we don't have time tonight. Um, we, if you're interested in some of the stories we've told in the past, you can listen to the full catastrophe, the podcast, and you will be able to hear such extraordinary stories like the time that Sarah's daughter's show and tell at school involved the police coming and her husband being accused of being an Afghan drug money launderer. <laughs> All the time that your mother... Daniel, your part husband, met your mother and your mother's boobs all at the same time. Yeah. First time he met her, he also saw her boobs. Stand up. My husband's here. Do you want to stand up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Both boobs, not just one. <laughs> not just one. Um, all the time Sarah had to get her aura cleansed but ended up with possum offal in her bed. And poo, possum offal and poo. Possum offal and dog poo. Yeah, yeah. But that, I would rather rub myself all over with possum offal and poo than do what Rebecca did where she tells it one story where she went to Ikea four times in one day with two-year-old twins. <laughs> right? Give me the offal any day. It's an awful story. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was terrible. It's really bad. Now, we're going to introduce Maxine McHugh, a person of extraordinary class and, and, and uh, extraordinary character. We're absolutely thrilled for her to be here tonight. She's been a journalist, a TV presenter. She is the thinking man sex symbol. And woman's. And woman's sex symbol. She's slayed a prime minister. 
She became a Labor MP in the Rudd Gillard, Rudd Gillard, Rudd Gillard <laughs> government. <laughs> it's kind of like a two-step. Um, she's now at the University of Melbourne in the Department of Education and she has an absolutely fantastic podcast called Talking Teaching, which is her interviewing some wonderful teachers. Welcome, Maxine. Well, good evening, everyone. Doing well? Okay. What a bunch of tragics you are. <laughs> Out on a cold Melbourne night, listening to a bunch of catastrophists. Where to start? Well, as the most senior member of this group, I could out-catastrophise the lot of you. That is not a function of talent, merely the outcome of a life lived in the trenches of hope, disappointment, discovery, joy, an occasional revelation, and huge dollops of disaster. In short, your average life. So let's start with the early years. How long have I got? <laughs> in the days before we measured such things, my vanity must have been off the chart when I, I asked, as a preschooler, my much-loved grandmother, Nan, Am I pretty? Long pause. <laughs> Too long. Well, she said, you're not a plain child. <laughs> not the answer I wanted. And my first lesson in the catastrophic put down. I think about that every now and then. It's sometimes, you know, a pop-up thought as I grip the one available tram strap most mornings and try desperately to avoid really close contact with the clearly dehydrated individual who is looming over me and clutching one of those supersized sugar-charged slurpy drinks, you know the ones, the ones without the lid. <laughs> and I stand there. I anticipate the impending catastrophe if the tram's charioteer is an intern driver and having a bit of fun with sudden braking. The Slurpee will end up all over me and my carefully assembled ensemble. It will be all I can do to refrain from doing a Helen Garner, pulling a ponytail or chugging a beard as I deliver a verbaling. You know, something like, ever considered going thirsty, even just for two stops? <laughs> so undignified, so tawdry. But then, such is the brutishness of life that I find, modern life, that savoir faire, you know, the old rules of Emily Post, they just don't cut it anymore. But let me at least try and lift the tone, because after all, here we are at a venue in a literary centre in the precinct of the State Library of Victoria. I think of writers who have taken part in this series, the wonderful, of course, and always amusing Frank Morehouse. Now think about it. A full-on catastrophe for Frank would be waking up one morning and forgetting what a martini is. <laughs> Imagine it. Then too, in the catastrophe department, the upcoming Melbourne Writers' Festival, and I know your literary types will have taken note of this, I think the upcoming literary festival could really pack a punch by putting the already invited Ronan Farrow on the same panel as his father and his brother-in-law, Woody Allen. <laughs> now, that's an encounter that could be thrillingly catastrophic. <laughs> now, this is all very well, but I suspect, I suspect that you have come here tonight to hear about some moment of personal ruination, some calamity, some slip on a banana peel moment that stripped me of auteur and robbed me of self-belief. Well, I'm not one for Oprah-style confessions, not my style at all, but as I don't want to disappoint my good friend Rebecca and because she's promised to stump up for dinner later, haven't you? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I shall, I shall share, as we say, I shall share a little tale of momentary misery. We need to rewind to my previous life as an MP, my brief but intense life as an MP, to a time, an almost glorious pre-lapsarian time, 
when the likes of Pauline checked her tears, and when politicians called Barnaby were boringly monogamous before they'd even hit on Rebecca. <laughs> oh, happy days. So, a long, 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 long time ago, on a particular parliamentary sitting day, and armed with permission from the whip, only in Westminster-style democracies do grown-ups get to be treated like charges at a boarding school. That's another story. I left the walled garrison of Parliament House to attend a lunch address at the National Press Club, just a short trip away, but my ticket of leave had strict limits. I had to be back on the hill by the time the bells rang for question time at two o'clock. No problem. The 90 minutes of promised liberation from both the scorn of the opposition, not to mention the Machiavellian play of my own colleagues, well, it was time to be treasured, or so I thought. Who knows the speaker that day? Who knows what was served? Mind you, I've always been fond of lunch. In another life, I'd even picked up awards for actually taking people to lunch and getting them to talk. But this was to be no bacchanalian revel. This day would not end with delight in remembered bon mots. Too soon, I was distracted by a persistent set of text messages. Libby, who knew? <laughs> a persistent set of text messages from my office. The gist of it was this. Channel 7 cameras are waiting outside the press club for you. Ambush. Why? What had I done to warrant any media attention? I was still in the doghouse for my political masters and prohibited from talking about anything. That's a really long story and I've written a book about it, but I've only got seven minutes tonight. So back to the story, what was up? Just as dessert was being plonked down and the head of the press club calling for questions, another text alluded to some journalistic concoction about my entitlement claims. At this stage, like the old song says, I was getting just a bit bothered and bewildered. Key, I texted back. Lamy pens, came the reply. You're close to the allowable limit. You can see the seriousness of this. Why are you laughing? A high level comms strategy was required. Conclusion? A nothing. Right, how about a high level transport strategy? Couldn't you get Scotty to beam me up from the roof of the press club. You know, nothing too obtrusive. Ha ha, they say. Don't worry, my increasingly worried staff text back. Car will be right outside. Say nothing and get back here pronto. Got it. When stressed, I can take direction. At five to two, I walk out of the press club, sticking close to the rest of the departing lunch pack and hoping this will provide some protection. Well, what do you know? Quicker than you can say alarmy pen. And when confronted with the intrusive glare of what's clearly an unfriendly camera, it's remarkable how efficiently the crowd disperses. <laughs> Suddenly, everyone around is vanishing really quickly into their cars. Never were so many able to get away so fast and leave me standing alone and palely loitering with a lens this far, this close to my face. I thought the jacket over the head won't quite cut it, <laughs> nor the outstretched hand of aggression. Just get out of here. Where's, where's the car? Where's the bloody car? If I'd had a pen on me, Lamy or any other kind, I would have happily used it as a weapon. See what brutes we become. But salvation is close at hand. Just ahead, yes, there's, there's the black SUV with the back passenger door open. That's it, get in, get going. I'm in. Put your foot on it, I snap at the driver. We're moving. Oh, glorious acceleration. Within minutes, I'll be back at the garrison. But hang on, who are these other people <laughs> in my car? <laughs> Slowly, a new universe comes into focus as the panic of the getaway recedes. Who's this bloke sitting up front beside the driver? He looks awfully like Phil Corey. And 
This woman with the ringlets and the mad men style puffy skirt who's sitting beside me and looking at me in the oddest way, gosh, she looks like Annabelle Crabb. <laughs> mm. It is Annabelle Crabb. I have dodged Channel 7 on the curb only to jump into the Fairfax media car. And I have to spend five long minutes in the company of a couple of journos. It is a truly creative moment for all parties. I have to say, remarkably, Phil and Annabelle behave impeccably. They don't have any questions about pins, only missed Commonwealth cars. They even offer to drop me off at the ministerial entrance. Very generous, considering we're all racing to meet that 2 p.m. deadline. So, folks, the day I got into the wrong car certainly qualifies as the full catastrophe. But, hey, I'm resilient. I'm only marginally embarrassed these days, all these years later, when I run into either Phil or Annabelle. And I look back on that incident now and think, if only I'd had the wit to use that five minutes to exchange a few notes on some good winter recipes. <laughs> Just another of life's missed opportunities. Thank you so much, Magdalene. Um, we've got our final... Now, whenever we do the full catastrophe, we like to have a token male, you know, because I don't feel that um, men have enough say in our society or enough platforms really um yeah do that yeah so sammy shah we need to know what you're wearing before you start yep. tonight uh, and who's looking after your children who's looking after your children yeah. is it the same babysitter as <laughs> he's got or if you right. also harassed your babysitter with text right. messages we would like to know everything so Shami is a comedian and a writer as well and he gets up at the ungodly hour of 3.30 in the morning at the moment so he can bring you breakfast on Melbourne radio and he's going to tell, well, this one actually is a bit outside the brief because it's a real catastrophe, whereas for the rest of us it's all, you know, quite manageable. Um, <laughs> but he's going to tell about what happened when he was discovered and named as ungodly. So welcome, Sammy, please. <laughs> It's, uh, it's all Kmart, by the way. Um, I'm an ABC employee. Four cents on the dollar does not get you much of a salary, it turns out. Um, so last year, ISIS was trying to kill me. Uh, now, uh, to be fair, ISIS is trying to kill all of us, but they really tried to kill me for a while. Uh, so what happened is uh, I wrote a book. Uh, in the book, it's called The Islamic Republic of Australia. It came out six months ago. Uh, it's no longer available in bookstores because none of you bought it. And <laughs> anyway, uh, and, and in the book, I talk about the fact that I was born a Muslim uh, in, a Mus in a Muslim country. I grew up a Muslim. Uh, I was a religious person. And then when I uh, you know, grew up, became a teenager and in my early 20s, I stopped being religious uh, because I could read then. And... Um, <laughs> And, uh, and the thing is, I want to tell that story. I want to talk about how I, you know, I was a Muslim and I wasn't a Muslim, but I want to tell the story with nuance because historically Muslims have had zero chill about that subject. And so I decided to write this book. It's called The Islamic Republic of Australia. It, it's interviews with Muslims across Australia about their lives, their perspectives, and in between is like my story kind of interwoven. And, um, and the whole thing came out, and it was, I was very proud of it. It's 500 pages of nuance and understanding and perspective. And, uh, and then the Daily Mail got involved. Now, the thing is, no one tells you when the Daily Mail is going to get involved in your life. You don't, it's, there's nobody ever tells you, hey, the Daily Mail is coming. You just one day wake up and the Daily Mail is there. And it's just, it's a thing. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm now at this. And what happened is the Daily Mail did what they do. They took that book with all its nuance and, and understanding and perspective, and they smooshed it down into a giant headline which said, Sami Shah hates Islam. And, uh, and they published that online. And it kind of spread around the world really fast, way better, did way better than my book sales ever did. Um, 
Ironically, the only other time my book did marginally well was when a few months after, a few days after it came out, uh, Pauline Hansen, this is true, Pauline Hansen took a photograph of the book put it up on her Facebook page, because the book title is The Islamic Republic of Australia. I thought it was a funny title, um, but she took it as a how-to guide, <laughs> not lying, put it on a Facebook page, and said, look at what they're teaching now. And, and, and her followers were outraged, they were furious, and I figured there's nothing more appropriate than One Nation supporters judging a book literally by its cover. That's kind of their philosophy. And, um, so, so the Daily Mail thing happened, and it kind of spread all over the Muslim world. Like, oh, in every Muslim country, everyone knew it, everyone was sharing it. And, um, and it turns out Muslims believe in three things. Uh, they believe in the Quran, which is the sayings of Allah. They believe in the Hadith, which is the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. And they believe in the Daily Fucking Mail. And... Um, <laughs> And I started getting death threats, I started getting abuse, I started getting all, every, on Twitter, on Facebook, and email. Um, I started getting all kinds of th like, threatening messages. We're gonna come and kill you, we're coming to kill you. A lot of photoshopped images, by the way. Like, I don't know what the career path is from graphic design student to ISIS supporter, but there seems to be a really good link, because those guys are amazing at their work, and no seams or edges or anywhere. And, and I'm getting all these messages and everything, and I started panicking. Because when someone tells you ISIS is trying to kill you, you start believing ISIS is trying to kill you. That's literally what most government policy is based around when the ratings drop. And, and so I started worrying, and, and as, at the point, I started getting calls from people in Pakistan, all my friends who were journalists there, uh, they started calling me up, they're like, hey, ISIS is trying to kill you, you should be really careful, ISIS is trying to kill you, and, and I'm panicking. At the time as this happened, this whole thing unfolded, on the same day that I was at Supernova, it's a comic book convention in Melbourne and Sydney, I had gone there because I am, other than many things, a geek. And, and I'd gone there to celebrate comic book. I left Islam and became a comic book lover. That's my <laughs> journey. It's in the book. Anyway, and, and so I, I was there, and I'm in the green room, and, I, and I'm on the phone with this journalist from Pakistan, and he's like, ISIS is trying to kill you. And I was like, oh my god, I don't know what to do about this. And, and just then, this actually happened as well. Just then, Chris Hemsworth <laughs> walks into the green room. I'm not saying this to be like a show off like I hang out with Chris Hemsworth. I have never again crossed paths with Chris Hemsworth. It's, that's not my life in any way. I know I don't want to be a tall poppy. I know in Australia we cut down the tall poppy. We don't tall. In Pakistan we smoke it. We know what to do. But <laughs> Chris Hemsworth walks in sits down next to me as I'm on the phone with a journalist in Pakistan who's saying ISIS is trying to kill me, and Chris Hemsworth turns to me and goes, hey, what's up? <laughs> and for the first time and only time that day, I thought, ISIS can't kill me, Thor is here. <laughs> I've, I've been an atheist now since I was 23 years old, and that was the first time I put my faith in a higher deity. <laughs> It just happened to be the Norse god of thunder for some reason. So this is whole thing is unfolding. Like it goes on for several days and, and it stretches into weeks. It, it really got bad. Like I got very frightened for a while. I didn't know if I could leave the house. Um, I, saw, I was getting death threats all the time. My family in Pakistan was worried. They were getting threats and abuse. And, and at one point, I became genuinely very paranoid as a person. I kind of spiraled and I'd spent all night for two nights looking out the window at cars kind of going up and down the lane. Um, I used to, I, I, in between I decided I'll go to a comedy gig. I need to do comedy, it's my therapy, it's cheaper, and, and, and so I'll go do that. And I went to this comedy show, I pulled up in front of the comedy show, I get out of the Uber, and this guy walks right in front of the comedy venue and looks at me, and he looked like, like I, it's a steer, he looked, <laughs> He looked like a terrorist, or he looked like, he lo I can say it, it's fine. He, um, he looked like a terrorist, and, and he looked at me, and I was like, this is ISIS, ISIS is here to kill me. And, I pan and by the way, spoiler alert, he was a fan. He'd heard I was doing a comedy show there. He's like, oh, I want to support Sammy Shah, so he went down to watch the show. Um, and I didn't know that, of course. I get up on stage, he's in the audience. I'm making eye contact with him. 
The entire time, I'm like, any second, he's going to attack me. He's going to come at me. He's going to stab me. I got to defend myself. I did the gig with my hand, with a cord wound around my hand, so I could use this as a bludgeon, like just. <laughs> Later, when my fr- I told my friends about this, they're like. If ISIS is trying to kill you, shouldn't you not tether yourself to the stage by tying the cord around? I was like, yes. I'm not, I didn't think of this out. Um, so I'm at home, two days now. Every night, I just look out the window at cars passing up and down the lane. And I'm constantly thinking, I'm like, is that the ISIS car? Is that the ISIS car? Is that? And finally, one night, one of the cars stops at every house. And I'm watching it th- 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm watching through the blinds. It stops at every house. And it stops at my house. And then it goes on and goes on. And I'm like, that's the ISIS car. That was the ISIS car. And the next morning, I wake up and I leave the house. And my back tire is punctured. And I'm like, ah, oh, ISIS did that. <laughs> and then I was like, wait. If all ISIS did was puncture tires, We'd be okay with them. We wouldn't have, like, ISIS has taken over Raqqa. Quickly call RACV. Like, I, you know, it's fine. We wouldn't worry so much. Like, that's not... That b- and then I started thinking, okay, obviously ISIS is not actually going to come and kill me. It's just sending threats. It's no different from the threats I get on radio all the time for not being Red Simons. And... <laughs> and... I'm like, this is just... It's a thing. It's, it's, like, it's not real. It's not... And then I started thinking, what about that car? Like, what were they thinking? Because they're probably just someone going to a party late at night, and they're looking for an address. They're like, is that 63B? Is, is that 63B? Is, th- is that 163B? Is that... Dude, is that brown guy staring at us through the window? <laughs> oh my god, is that ISIS? Like, that's what would have happened. Um, but luckily, they haven't killed me yet, so I'm still here. Thanks, everyone. My name's Sammy Shaw. a real problem like <laughs> normally normally people come and they say oh my dog got sick and yeah and now no ice is trying to kill you it's a genuine that's thing. our real that's first full catastrophe that's actually. our actual yeah. first in two years real catastrophe oh, that ever yeah. happened yeah. yeah wow but look hipsters do sometimes look like terrorists i'm with you i know what you mean yeah it's hard to tell the difference we want to thank our wonderful catastrophizers tonight sammy libby maxine and giselle thank them so much <laughs> Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.